Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. I'm your host and your guide. And as I say every podcast, my job is to get you off the brink. Remember, this all came about after my first book, On the Brink, A Fresh Lens to Take Your Business to New Heights, was published and won an award. And everybody said, how do I get off the brink? And there's no better way to do it than to listen to the speakers on this podcast talk about how you can get better at whatever you're doing to change. Remember, people hate to change. And so our job is to make change your friend, embrace change, and see things through a fresh lens. And I say that because we decide with the eyes and with the heart and how it feels. And then our brains get engaged and you begin to think about it. So today, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Carrie Flynn Barrett. Now, let me tell you about Carrie. Carrie gave a talk at the Westchester Business Council not too long ago, and I was just intrigued by her presentation. The topic was on burnout, but what was most interesting was her perspectives that came from a healthcare background like my own. I did about seven years in healthcare as an executive. I wasn't a nurse, as she was, but I sure understood the feelings that you get when you're working with an organization of, I don't know, 2,500 or 5,000 people, all of whom work hard to make your life better. And then she launched her business not long ago to be, of all things, a infractional chief human resource officer. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about her journey. But the question she's asking is, are you an organization that understands that people are your most valuable assets? And I must tell you, coming out of the pandemic, oh, the people questions, the chief people officers who are reaching out to us, what do we do? Everything's changed. Really important questions that we'll do. Managing individuals with individual needs and roles is challenging for the even the best companies. And managing people is the hardest job, full stop. In fact, we can't get anything done as leaders or managers without followers. And why do people follow you? Are they bystanders? Are they invested in what you're doing? Do they believe in you? Every leader asks me the same question. How do I get things done through others? How about with others instead of through them? It's an interesting question. Carrie, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Andy, so much for having me. Such a pleasure. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you. But let's tell our listeners and our viewers about your own journey. You have a great story to share. Please share it. Who is Carrie Flynn Barrett and what have you done? Sure. So uh, I believe very strongly uh, in the fact that we are a person from the start. It doesn't mean that's what our journey is on where we began. So I began as a nurse. Uh, I have worked in healthcare for so many years, but that doesn't mean that's the only place where my journey was. So I was a nurse, an ICU and emergency department nurse for over 12 years, and I loved doing what I did. But then I switched over to the world of HR, and I worked in, in that field for 25 or so years and loved every minute of it, really, truly. Um, it's such a fascinating world. And when you think about it, it's all about working with people right? Nursing and HR, it's all about working with people and coming up with different strategies. And um, as I have said, and I what I work in, in my practice, I use the nursing process all the time in my practice. So it's, it, it's all about that process. It's about how we assess what's going on in a scenario, right? We have to listen, as you said, we have to use our eyes. Mm -hmm. We also have to use our ears, yes. right? So that's such an important part of my journey in going from nursing into HR, right? So back, as you said, just three years ago, I started my own practice, Flynn Barrett Consulting, right before the pandemic. So probably all of you are saying, oh my goodness gracious, how do you start a business? And then boom, the pandemic hits. So I have been incredibly lucky or uh, just happenstance to be an HR in a time in the pandemic when HR was really needed. Uh, so uh, it's been quite the journey. And even in, from the time of starting uh, my business, 
that business has flowed very, very differently in the three years of time. So I refer to myself as a fractional chief HR officer. So I help companies with their HR strategy. And I use, as I said, the nursing process in what I do with companies. So often companies come to me because they are having people problems. As we said, you know, companies really the most important asset are their people. And this is such a difficult time in the world right now with, you know, people finding new jobs, leaving the organizations, the great resignation, how many people are just really sick of hearing that term. I'm sick of hearing that term <laughs> or the other term, which is quiet quitting. I have em employers saying to me or CEOs saying to me, how do I know that my employees are not quiet quitting? <laughs> well, you know, this, this is one of the challenges that a lot of companies are facing. So people problems are huge right now. So this is, you know, it, it is a lot of fun working at this time, but equally, there are so many challenges that are out there. And it doesn't mean that there is always the uh, perfect solution for one company is exactly the same solution, Andy, for that next company. Well, you know, Carrie, when we were preparing for this, I mentioned you have several leadership academies <clears throat> and the topic is around how does one get things done with others? I mean, that's the essence of a company. And sometimes people come to me and they say, we have enormous retention problems. It's our culture. We wanna go back to the culture pre-pandemic. Well, what was that culture pre-pandemic? Or I love the literature, Financial Times, my favorite reading in the morning. And there's tremendous uh, insights in France, for example, where they insist that you do not work on the weekends. You have your private time. You know, talk about burnout. And now I think Portugal and Spain have adopted this as well. The hardest part when you're remote working is what is the weekend? <laughs> when is the weekend? Right. And how do you do it? And then you have hybrid. And there was a great um, research from McKinsey I was just reading where women are perfectly happy not going back. And how are they using the time that they're not commuting? Well, they're doing all kinds of fulfilling things. Remember that work-life balance? Well, it got in balance because now I had time to do life. And so there are real fundamental, pardon me, transformations going on. And as you shake your head, yes, our listeners say she's shaking her head, yes. The question is, what are you saying? What would be in your, your process analysis, you know, to help a, a client listening to think through what would I do now to begin to assess the major questions that are facing us as employers and employees to get our businesses really thriving. Your thoughts? Well, I, I will tell you very often in this time right now, employers are saying, should I bring my employees back full time? That seems to be the top question. Uh -huh. And my response is by answering it with a question. Why do you need to bring your employees back? full time. And so I think it's important for that analysis to be done as to is it important for that particular business? And it does depend upon the business. Obviously, if we're talking about hospitality business, that, that's a different story. And healthcare business, depending upon the position within the business, it makes a difference. If you're talking about a finance position within healthcare, that's, that is a position that could be remote or hybrid, as opposed to a direct caregiver, obviously needs to be in person. So we need to be looking at this very, very specifically down to those nitty gritty details to make sense on whether or not we're bringing people back. Um, so that makes a very big difference when we're talking about culture. And when I hear companies say, oh, I want to go back to what the culture used to be, or, you know, employees are being very demanding now. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because I'm thinking about employees are, you know, you know, I will say, well, tell me what you mean by employees being very demanding. Well, you know, I'm, I, um, my employees are saying that they require that they work hybrid. 
And so my response is always, well, is it something that works for your workplace for them to work hybrid? Well, yes, it does. Well, then if it does, why is it that we're calling those employees demanding? Isn't it something that actually is working? And why aren't we working together as a team on what's best for your organization rather than having an um more of an argument about it and fighting about it. So it's really, I find it really fascinating because in my lifetime, I think about these demanding employees. I wish I could have been a little bit more demanding as an employee when I was earlier in my career, I probably would have done way better. Um, but I don't think that in many cases, employees are actually being demanding. I think employees are actually looking at some scenarios and actually looking at them, um, not with rose colored glasses, but looking at them thoughtfully and saying, you know, does it really make a difference if I'm doing this work at home or in the office? And I recently actually wrote a blog about this, Andy, because if in fact we're bringing employees back to the office and they're sitting in an office and they're on Zoom calls in the office, what is the point, right? <laughs> that just makes absolutely no sense, right? So then the employees feel like, well, you've really kind of duped me. That, that That is just not really treating me as a professional. So if in fact you have meaningful work for somebody in the office and that makes sense, then, then absolutely. But if you are, if you don't, then, then let's, you know, let's really think about that twice. All in all, sit down with your employees, talk with your employees, listen to what their challenges are, and just also just listen to them for their ideas because they have great thoughts. Yeah, you know, that's why you hired them. Otherwise, it's not a great reflection on you if you think that you've hired people who aren't that smart, right? Um, you hired them because they're smart and you should listen to them. I love the conversation where it's going. Two things I want to add. I often preach, being an anthropologist as I am, that words create our worlds. And as I'm listening to you, I can hear the leadership, the C-suite, um, mimicking others who maybe they play golf with or have a conversation with, who are all mm -hmm. often men thinking about um, their stature and their mastery as being in the C-suite. And that is about demand and, and, and owning and controlling the environment in which people are working. Mm -hmm. And I find that the most exciting clients I have are the ones who are asking the question with a real openness to change the words that are creating their worlds. Mm -hmm. And we know that the challenge for humans is we live the stories in our minds. And there's nothing more frightening than change because the cortisol is flying around there saying, oh, fear this. But for those who are leading, pause for a moment and change the story. Couldn't you be a leader in the next breed of companies that thrive and thrive. Remember, some of the major companies, WordPerfect, for example, is a global company with everyone remote. You know, take a look at what people can do if they right. are in the office. That's right. And the gig economy has become a really interesting, flexible workforce for you, but it requires you to change your mind and don't be a copycat. Think about what is it that you can do and create something new because everything is new now. It's not That's what it right. used to be, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't mean that just because somebody isn't working in front of you, that they're not working. Yes. And, right. And productivity can be measured in different ways than tracking someone's computer. Yes. Now that's a big topic. Are we moving to outcomes evaluation as opposed to a punch card and time? Are we still in a machine model mode of a workplace? Or are we managing minds? And I thought, I've been preaching for many years now, that we've moved from managing hands to managing minds. But the mindset of coming back into the office feels like i got to manage that person as opposed to the product. What do you see? I'm seeing a little bit of both. I'm seeing a little bit of both. And I think it depends upon the particular leader. 
Uh, I think that unfortunately, um, sometimes past uh, past practice past practice or past performance of someone has created a fear factor. So for example, if a particular leader has had someone um, really perform poorly and in the you know in the past, uh, they have unfortunately taken that model and said, well, because, X person did this, I'm not going to allow anybody else to do it. Instead of saying, okay, that person was the anomaly and I'm going to allow others to just uh, do, you know, uh, others who are professionals to rise above and be able to do it. So unfortunately I'm seeing some of that um, and there's just too much of a fear factor. And I think that's because uh, the uh, threat of the recession is there. And I, I think there's there's just some some fear of the of the recession and money. Uh, so I, I there's a little bit more of that right now. Yep. Um, but I think the more progressive leaders, to your point, are just more comfortable in their own skin and more comfortable in their own practice. And they are very, very open to saying to the employees, what's what works best for you? Unless of course, it is an environment where it is very dictated by, uh, you know, like a creative environment where they do need to bring people together, for example. It, it's, it's um, and then we have the challenge of another generation. <clears throat> I often talk about demography is destiny. And so you have a workplace. I mean, I had one great client whose board were mostly boomers. And most of his new hires were all the Gen Ys and some Gen Zs. And they had very different ideas about everything. <clears throat> it was like they were foreign languages, both speaking English, but boy, they didn't understand each other at all. And so now you have that added to the mix. Are you finding that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, in addition to that, uh, I refer to, um, I, I don't really discuss that much about the, the generation as much as I discuss empowered workers. Uh -huh. um, and because uh, I find that empowered workers can be of any generation. You're right. And um, I think <clears throat> sometimes uh, those in Gen X and Gen Y get a or just millennials get a bad rap and they get kind of stereotyped in as being difficult. And um, I don't necessarily find that to be the case always. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is, it is funny though, that I do, I am seeing a lot of the empowered workers kind of versus the seasoned workers is what I refer to it as. And so um, there is somewhat of uh, the seasoned workers feel that the empowered workers need to go through this rite of passage. You know, we did this and we had to suffer. So therefore you're going to have to do that. And I don't know. I, I don't understand that why we would want anyone to have to go through something and suffer. I don't, really <laughs> aspire well, to that thinking so that's human creativity because the longing is so important and in their mind in order to belong to this organization you have to go through a rite of passage into right it. right you have to you know you know i don't know prick a finger and like let some go blood or I, you know whatever ritual, right but yeah. the interesting part is is to your point there's nothing reasonable or rational about it. It's a mm -hmm. human symbolic transformation of coming from the outside to become part of us. And we control the space. So therefore you can't get in unless we let you. But remember that millennials are 50% of the workforce now. Right, right. So, you know, the boomers hang on tight because the changes are coming. <laughs> and and somehow you got to embrace it. Right. And, and I have said that to some of the companies that I've worked with, you know, you can stand there kicking and screaming or you can accept, listen and learn. Um, it's entirely up to you which way that you go. 
um, I could make a suggestion, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> well, I actually had one situation where they gave the uh, new hires the job of mentoring the, the, those who had been there a while. Mm -hmm. and we won't put demographic, but, but it was how do we introduce you to them instead of them taking charge of you? And then mm -hmm. you come in and, and, and really educate them as to the things that matter because you're our future. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. And if we can build it together into a future that will thrive, but there are lots of things you don't know, but maybe those are all changed. I have one great client and their um, buyers had all retired and their salespeople were, you know, calling them back their buyers. Nobody was buying and they didn't understand why nobody was answering the phone. And as we did the research, the retirees were replaced by 30 somethings and they didn't answer the phone. And they weren't going to answer the phone and they weren't yeah. going to buy on the phone and they didn't want a relationship. <laughs> and it was sort of like, oh, I said, yeah, well, what are we going to do? I said, yeah. I think you're going to change. The yeah, way you got to figure this out, right? We're going to have to figure it out. Now, when you spoke at the Westchester Business Council, you spoke about burnout. And mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, not discuss, you had some great insights because this word you know, you're telling me, let's not talk about the great resignation. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sort of looking around and saying burnout is self-induced. You know, if in France, you don't have to work on the weekend here, do, is anyone telling you to work on the weekends? You know, is anyone telling you to work all the time? Um, and so can you share with our listeners and our viewers about your perspective on this thing called burning out? Sure. So uh, for sure, Andy, some of it is self-inflicted. You know, some people are just type A, naturally driven people, mm -hmm. and they want to get ahead. Um, I understand it. I'm a type A, you know, through to the core, always was, uh, probably always will be. In my own business, I made the choice on how it is that that I want to do things. So I get to work when I want to work. So I changed, I changed the whole uh, structure of how it is I do it. So I understand it. Um, I think that women have a very, very difficult time, uh, especially those who are type A, who are young in childbearing years and trying to get ahead in the yes. workplace, who are trying to do everything. Um, and I, I think that, uh, that our work community isn't always as supportive of them as should be. And I don't know that women are equally as supportive of fellow women as yes. we should be. And I think it is not always um, uh, allowed or uh, thought to be allowed because of stigmas for somebody to stand up and say that they just really are burnt. They're just really burnt out and they need a break. I don't think a lot of women feel that they have opportunities to make career changes uh, I don't think that they think that they can take a break and be able to come back into the workforce successfully. Uh, and so I, I think those are the types of things that we need to do a better job with. And I um, I hope we will uh, do a better job with it. There are some, some groups who are really helping women with that. But I, I think that that is something that is a real challenge. And I think it is something that um, that is real. And I think that there are corporations, uh, some corporations are very, very helpful um, and known to be supportive of women in the workplace. Well, the sum is an interesting word because <clears throat> whether it's uh, gender bias <clears throat> or it's, you know, understanding that women do have to care for children and what's wrong with that? Can't we get a child care center here to make it easier for them? And actually thinking about women in the whole as opposed to um, another worker. And, and it's an interesting time for, I always preach, never waste a crisis use the pandemic as an opportunity to think big. <clears throat> you know, the women aren't coming back after the pandemic the way the workplace could use them. 
Right. With a recession, that'll be fine. But but they just aren't. They they basically are looking for jobs or careers that will allow them to balance in a different fashion. They've discovered they can work from home. And I used to coach women who were executives in a client and they were taking care of the laundry and cooking dinner and working on the computer and taking care of the kids and working on the computer and taking care of meetings. And they didn't miss a beat, but they had life in a very different, very interesting fashion. And they said to me, you know, this is really cool. I can get life done and also work. And I went, oh, there's some, there's kernels of real interesting stuff. Was it hard? Yes. But mm-hmm. the fact of life is, you know, unless mm-hmm. you're going to be a stay-at-home mom and that's hard, <clears throat> there isn't yeah. anything, quote, easy. Right. And I used to laugh. People would say, I have to balance life and work. I said, isn't work life? And and isn't life work? I mean, what, where do words create our worlds? And right. then, so, you know, you have a challenging time of it. Um, but as you guys were talking about burnout, there was this sense that if it's not in our hands and we can't control it, It isn't really in the boss's hands either. And I've heard too many places who have said to their management, Mm -hmm. don't talk about about behavioral health. Don't Mm -hmm. talk about emotional well-being. You know, it's not not appropriate for us to talk about. I don't want to talk about it. And I'm saying to myself, well, maybe it's not a bad time to put it in part of the discussion um, because, you know, 30% of Americans are depressed. Right. And and that's that's just those who end up. Probably way more. (laughs) Way more. And, and, and you can't simply all deal with it with a pill. Um, and so life has become challenging. It's never been easy. Um, but I do think it's an interesting time to really rethink women in the workplace in a way that can be exciting and exhilarating instead of painful. And why not? Um, mm-hmm. You have 60% of the college graduates are women. They're all smart. Yeah. They're all looking for good opportunities. So... As you're looking ahead, anything coming into your future or ours that we could share? That you're well, I, I, I do have to say this to you, Andy, just to go backwards a little bit. Um, 30 years ago, I had a boss who told me that when I walked through the doors, I needed to park my life outside of the door Ooh. when I walked in. Wow. Ooh. And ah, I, had, I had, I had a six week old child oh. <laughs> and I told him, I, I told him that there was absolutely no way that I could ever possibly park my life outside the door. Oh, okay. that, that was just not humanly possible for me as a thinking, breathing person to do that in order to be able to do my job. And he said, and um, <laughs> I learned more from him. Uh, and I say this to this day on what never to do as a boss. <laughs> um, and uh, I so important. Um, it, and during the pandemic, there was a woman I, who I knew who was a C-suite person who was on a call and her four-year-old was climbing over her. She was on a Zoom call and all the other C-suite individuals were men and she was criticized afterwards by her boss because of the fact that her child was climbing on her and she did the call just like everybody else and it was not a problem and she said to them she said you do realize all of your wives probably were taking care of your children and my husband was on his call his business call and I didn't skip a beat on that call So why is it that we criticize our women who are doing this? Totally unacceptable. So we have to do a better job. Did they say anything to her? Or was it just simply her trying to establish the credibility? I mean, I I couldn't agree with you and her more. But the attitude was, you know, don't mix that. Why? I mean, I didn't miss a beat on my call. I performed perfectly. Can you imagine? Her boss said something to her afterwards that it was inappropriate for her to have her child in the call. So um, what's what's going forward? I think that we can do a much better job for men, for women, 
for everyone, for transgender, for every single person in the workplace. I think we can be incredibly inclusive. I think that we could do a better job in just general equity. Um, just hearing about wage equity, thinking about that this morning, what's going on. November 1st is here tomorrow, New York City and Westchester County coming in uh, wage equity. Thank goodness we're doing this. Um, I think it's important for people to know that they have choices in the workplace and that they should speak their mind. And if the workplace doesn't accept that, then maybe it's just not the right workplace for them. And there are people out there who will help them to find another workplace. So I think that's very important for people to know. The times they are changing, as Bob Dylan yes. told us. That's right. Um, but but I think that we can't go backwards. And when people say the pandemic put women back 30 years, it breaks my heart. But we can't let it. And we must move uh -huh. it forward, mostly for business sake. Our economy depends upon vibrant businesses. And women leading companies are doing amazing jobs. And it's a time for change. So let's brace change and make it our friend and see how great things can be. Carrie, one or two things you don't want the listeners to forget. Uh, I, I just don't want people to stop listening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's just the most right. important thing and to stop and listen, to put your phone down. Mm -hmm. Don't be, don't be looking at your phone while you're listening, whether or not it's your child, your husband, your employee, whatever it is. I agree, Just I really agree. listen to listen. Yeah. I, I think that is the one thing that you could do for your employees that's so important. And every single employee deserves 10 minutes of time, whether or not it's once a week, once every two weeks. I think that is absolutely critical. Um, and if you tell me you don't have time for that, then you and I uh, could really talk and we could talk about how you could better use your time uh, that would help you so that you can find that 10 minutes of time. Add to that, that when you listen, try and stay focused on what they are saying, not what you're thinking, <clears throat> because our minds are trying to take the words they're saying and make sense out of them in the story that we have in our mind, not really what you're hearing. And that's I right. I can only tell you how many times in our careers, it wasn't what they said, it's what we heard. And it mm -hmm. had nothing to do with what they meant. And that is- yeah, Ask question. questions to clarify, exactly. right? Make sure you really understand. And that means you cannot have your cell phone sitting there or your computer in front of you. That's you right. Can focus. This has been such fun. If they want to reach you, where could they do that, Carrie? Oh, very simply, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is KFB, so easy to find me, KFB at FlynnBarrett.com. I have my own uh, website. It's www.FlynnBarrett.com. And please reach out. I have a contact me on my website and you can just send a quick question or an inquiry. I look forward to hearing from anybody. If you want a very smart fractional chief human resource officer or just a very sharp coach or someone who can help you see, feel, and think in new ways, meet Carrie Flynn Barrett because she's here to help you do just what we love to do, which is to change. And the times they are changing, you may need a hand. So for all of our listeners, thank you for coming. It's always so much fun to share with you smart people who are really here to help you do what I love, see, feel, and think in new ways. And remember, we're here, too, to help your organization adapt to these fast-changing times. Stay with us. Stay tuned and listen to some of the webinars and the speeches that I have posted on our website. We're talking all the time about how to make change your friend, how to embrace change, and particularly how to rethink women in the workplace. And on that note, I'll say have a great day. Remember, our theme is take observation and turn it into innovation. I hope you've had a great day today. Bye-bye now.